to do this. Um, I, I am attending many of these summer schools but, uh, and giving talks, but never done a, a series of, of lectures. So this is a, a real pleasure. Um, so uh, my part of the, <coughs> this presentation is liquid crystals, which um, <coughs> It doesn't appear in the title, but sort of like an octopus is sort of <clears throat> integrated into soft matter with, with many, many, uh, <clears throat> is this on? Integrated into soft matter in many ways. Um, so, uh, I decided to, uh, in, in preparing this, to uh, kind of go the non mathematical route. <coughs> Which would be uh, <coughs> sort of a break in the <coughs> in the sort of the theme of the, the previous talks. Uh, we'll get into some math, but uh, <coughs> the uh, <coughs> this talk will just emphasize the broad field of liquid crystals, how it connects in various <coughs> in the various areas of soft matter and. Uh, <coughs> Kind of the uh, key points of the physics um, and uh, some applications. Um, okay, so actually, uh, the the field of liquid crystals as science emerged from biology. Um, so uh, my talk is going to sort of in this slide start out with biology, and there will be many connections, and then. <coughs> Uh, the last lecture will focus mostly on, on uh, connections with with biology. <clears throat> but uh, when when people started having microscopes available and started looking at um, <clears throat> at sort of preparations that were extracts from biological systems, then they <clears throat> they started seeing uh, <clears throat> seeing structures. Um, that were were fluid and dynamic. Um, the the discovery of, of liquid crystals is generally ascribed to uh, Frederick Reinser. Um, I'll be showing some photos of, of old white guys with beards. <coughs> Somehow I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, Ryan Sir was working in Prague at the German University in the Institute of, of Plant Physiology, and uh, they were <coughs> extracting, <coughs> well, they were trying to understand uh, why carrots were orange. Uh, <coughs> and but they extracted cholesterol from, from carrots. And then, in, in a simple reaction, uh, Reinhardt made this cholesterol would have an alcohol here. Uh, so then, uh, cholesterol, I mean, uh, Reinhardt made this, this phenyl ester of cholesterol. And uh, when he just thermally cycled it, he found that. Uh, <coughs> It, it didn't melt from the crystal to a liquid directly, but there was a, a rather broad temperature range where, you know, it was kind of cloudy. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and uh, so he thought this was interesting enough to, to publish, and <clears throat> this really started the, the field of, of uh, <clears throat> liquid crystals. Um, this 
generated uh, a you know a series of of, of work which uh, was took about thirty years before it was it was really uh, it was really accepted that this was a pure compound which exhibited uh, you know multiple phase transitions so. There were actually physical altercations at scientific meetings into the early 1900s concerning <clears throat> whether uh, this was a phenomenon coming from colloidal behavior that is uh, a non-uniform mixture or was a, a property of a pure material. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the next kind of <clears throat> uh, important transported the field was by, uh, by Lehmann, who started really systematically uh, studying these cholesterol esters and, and uh, a variety of different cholesterol esters. Um, so uh, he really uh, was the, the creator of living crystals as a field. And uh, he actually coined this name, Fusica Cristalla. So, uh, so why, why the name liquid crystals? Well, uh, the, these were fluids, so that's, that part's easy. And he used the word Cristalla because they were birefringent. Okay, so crystals. <coughs> Uh, their, one of their key optical properties was birefringence. And these fluids are birefringent, so they got the name, <coughs> he gave them the name, name, uh, name, name crystals. Okay, so, um, now there are a variety of, of ways of getting with the crystals. And we'll start with the, <coughs> the basic way, uh, kind of the, this initial, you know, following Lehmann and, and Reinser, uh, and, and, and think about molecular rods. So rod-shaped molecules, of which there are uh, three examples here. Um, so uh, these all have a, uh, a phase, the pneumatic phase, in which these, these anisotropic objects. So we're making anisotropy here chemically, by chemical synthesis. Uh, so these molecules uh, have a phase transition from an isotropic phase where they're randomly oriented to a pneumatic phase where they have, uh, they have uh, orientational, orientational order. So uh, they become birefringent. So what that means is that uh, if we look at this structure as an electromagnetic medium, it would have a dielectric tensor that was, uh, uh, its dielectric constant would be a tensor. Uh, and uh, the uh, optical properties would have to then be understood in terms of this optical anisotropy. Um, okay, well we'll talk in, in, in more detail about very a, various aspects of this phase, but I just want to start with the birefringence because you can't understand anything about the optics of liquid crystals without, uh, <coughs> without understanding birefringence. Um, so we're going to think about a cell, so we're, let's say we have this pneumatic, we can imagine that this is a glass plate, and in <clears throat> between a pair of these plates, we have a pneumatic liquid crystal oriented as I've drawn, and <clears throat> we're propagating light normal in normal to the screen. Okay, so K is the wave vector of the light. <clears throat> okay, so um, <clears throat> In the notes, so I outline the basic birefringence calculation. So, uh, in this geometry, I'm going to have a dielectric tensor with an epsilon xx 
and an epsilon yy. <clears throat> um, there's also going to be an epsilon zz. But <clears throat> if uh, we have this geometry where k is coming in normal to the director, then the zz component doesn't enter the problem. Um, <clears throat> OK, so uh, <clears throat> if you go back to Maxwell's equations, you know that you can uh, take the, the curl equations and eliminate, say, the magnetic field, and you get uh, <clears throat> this wave equation for the electric field. Um, and you can take as a, a solution to this differential equation a plane, a plane wave, a plane electromagnetic wave. Uh, <clears throat> you substitute this into that, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> you get <clears throat> uh, uh, an algebraic equation that relates the wave vector to the, the frequency. Um, <clears throat> so then you say, okay, we're going to take uh, the electric, this E naught field amplitude perpendicular to K, and then, uh, <clears throat> then you just get a simple equation that says that um, the wave vector is the vacuum wave vector omega over C times the refractive index. So light travels with <coughs> velocity c over n. All right, now in the liquid crystal case where uh, we have this optical anisotropy, then uh, <coughs> this, <coughs> in this equation, instead of simply having e here, we have, um, <coughs> we have epsilon dot e. So what appears in here is d in the original. <coughs> Equation and now d displacement is epsilon dot e, so so this equation becomes uh, <coughs> takes this form for this <coughs> this problem. Um, so our, we have our, our two by two dielectric constant with epsilon x x and epsilon y y. <coughs> e is now uh, uh, a column vector with a component in the x and in the y x and y direction. Okay, so again we have an algebraic equation that uh, <coughs> is, uh, is now an eigenvalue problem. Um, so uh, <coughs> the determinant, uh, setting the determinant equal to zero, in this case gives us two solutions. So uh, <coughs> One solution has k squared equal to, has this term equal to zero, k squared equal epsilon xx omega squared or c squared. Uh, so that, this is, that gives a, a, a k which is k back times uh, the square root of epsilon xx, which is the refractive index for light polarized in the x direction. Um, <clears throat> And if, if this term is zero, then uh, we calculate laid out this matrix, we see that the solution has to have EY equal to zero. So uh, <clears throat> this is a solution that's polarized along the x direction. And then the second term in the determinant gives us a solution polarized along the y direction. So <clears throat> in this pneumatic liquid crystal medium, Light, <clears throat> the two normal modes that propagate are linearly polarized, <clears throat> uh, either perpendicular to this average molecular orientation or parallel to it. So light resolves itself into linearly polarized propagating modes when it enters the liquid crystal. So if you <clears throat> if you have this this pneumatic with the average orientation, which is the director, vertical, uh, <clears throat> and uh, you shine, say, light <clears throat> in with some polarization, then this light, <clears throat> when it enters the blue crystal, in, 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 in the air, say, if this is going where glass, <clears throat> light's coming in. Uh, then you can have any orientation of the polarization, um, <clears throat> but in a liquid crystal, you can only have either E parallel or E perpendicular <clears throat> to the director, and this incident light will resolve itself into these two components in the liquid crystal. All right, so then 
once it enters the blood of the crystal, these two components, they travel with the different, <coughs> different wave vectors. We have K parallel and K perpendicular. Um, <coughs> so then there's, <coughs> there's a delta K. Um, <coughs> If it propagates a certain a distance d into the lunar crystal, then <clears throat> there's a phase shift that appears between these two polarizations, proportional to the <clears throat> propagation depth in the lunar crystal, and so they get out of phase. So um, <clears throat> if they start, let's say, I'm probably saying, well, they. Uh, uh, <clears throat> We start with theta equal 45 degrees. It's in polarization. <clears throat> um, for delta KD such that delta phi is pi over 2, then the two modes get 90 degrees out of phase. So we start out with linearly polarized light. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> for delta phi equals pi over 2, then these two components are 90 degrees out of phase, so then you end up with circularly polarized light. <coughs> Go to a phase shift pi, then the phase of this polarization relative to this, <coughs> relative to the initial, is changed by pi, and so then you end up with <coughs> polarization like this. So as the light propagates into the blue the crystal, uh, <clears throat> the, these phase shifts appear, and the um, sum of those two feet components <clears throat> give starts out linear, circular, <clears throat> linear the other way, and circular the other way. All right, so <clears throat> if we propagate through a certain distance, and then put in uh, an analyzer, so we start out with the polarizer like this at 45 degrees. Uh, if, for example, we put in an analyzer at minus 45 degrees, then, um, well, initially we would get extinction, so there would be no transmission. In circularly polarized condition, we have maximum transmission, so, um, <clears throat> The analyzer will <clears throat> at, <clears throat> at any <clears throat> particular time will have some component there will be some component in this field along the analyzer. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll get maximum transmission in this case where the, <clears throat> the analyzer is going to be um, <clears throat> parallel to the <clears throat> parallel to the polarization. Okay, so um, is the transmission equal in the circular bar? No, that's sort of in between, right? In between it. This half, is right. Uh, this is half. Right, this is half. This is zero and half in one transmission. <coughs> okay, so um, you can you can calculate the transmitted intensity or the transmission, which would be the ratio of the incident trend this is transmitted over incident intensity. Um, so theta is the, the angle that the uh, incident polarization makes with, with one of the principal axes of the dielectric tensor. Uh, <coughs> K <coughs> is 2 pi over lambda, so <coughs> this is uh, K delta n over 2. And then times, <coughs> sorry, k over 2, delta k over 2, and then times d. So this gives the wire representation. Right now, if you shine white light on, <coughs> on a sample, so <coughs> light with a distribution of wavelengths, since the transmission depends on the wavelength, then <coughs> through a certain thickness of sample, we'll get different phase shifts for the different wavelengths. So, for a typical white light spectrum, uh, this kind of standard chart shows what colors will appear between cross polarizer and analyzer in transmission as a function of, of the thickness. <coughs> Basically, 
retardation is d times delta n. Okay. <clears throat> so delta k you can write as k vacuum, which is omega over c, and then times delta n d. And the horizontal axis here is delta n d. So the sample's very thin. There's no phase shift, it's just black. <clears throat> as you increase the thickness, then the, the, the <clears throat> sort of short wavelength colors tend to show up <clears throat> first, and then the longer wavelength colors. And so you get a, a series of maxima that sort of scan through the visible range. And you end up with this, uh, <clears throat> with this color variation. Well, can you allow me how to read that? So on the, on the X -X okay, so this is retardation, and then the, the lines just show if you have a sample of a particular thickness, what a given retardation corresponds to in, in biofringence. So if we have a liquid crystal with a biofringence of 0.1, you know, and a thickness of 4 microns, then we, we, you know, it should be yellow. Okay. Okay, so here's the pneumatic of the crystal texture. Um, and okay, so here's a series of textures. If I tune the biofringence to zero for the liquid crystal, these would all be black. Okay. <clears throat> this is a bent core, this is a, a, a chiral pneumatic. <clears throat> Another bent core, another bent core text. So all the colors you see here arise from from the birefringence of the crystal. Okay. Um, okay. So <clears throat> liquid crystals have fairly strong birefringence, which makes this a really useful technique for. <clears throat> well, I mean, you just have to look at these. It's obvious. Then you get a lot of information. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, it's also clear that uh, you have to understand something about the system to do so. All right, so here's uh, what's called a pneumatic fluid texture. So we have a pair of glass plates. We're looking at transmission between cross polarizer and analyzer. Um, we have a uh, the liquid crystal is <clears throat> filling this cell, which is, uh, you can tell from the, from the colors here, it's, it's only a few, couple microns thick. Um, and the pneumatic <clears throat> director, that is the average orientation, is constrained on the surface to lie parallel to the surface. But there's no in-plane, there's no in-plane constraint. <clears throat> um, so this is a random planar alignment. Uh, you would get this, for example, typically with just very clean glass. So all those biofringent changes are just material properties. They're just material. Okay, what's happening? No, what's happening here is that the thickness of the cell is gradually changing. So you know we're going, it's going from yellow through this pink, blue, green. So we're um, <clears throat> on the, we're sort of in here. Yellow, pink, blue, green in there. And can you, can, the, the, can you go over the, the pictures, like what do they represent? We just kind of lost the physical meaning of the Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of showing, we're going to look, talk about textures in, in detail. Uh, <clears throat> But here, what's happening is that the you know the the, bio, the, the effect of biofringence is <clears throat> this is a, you know really just an effect of, of varying thickness. So this is actually a liquid crystal layer, a thin layer that's on uh, the surface of glycerin. So there's air liquid crystal glycerin. Uh, this is uh, maybe a couple hundred microns across. So, so, what's, the, what's the scale of the change in thickness that link you to cycle through the visible spectrum? 
Like, like how, how different a thickness are we talking? Well, um, so let's just say, let's just say delta n is 0.14. So we are. Um, I'm sorry, I can't quite make that the scale. That yeah, okay, we're from here to here. So the thickness is going from something like 6.5 to 7.5 microns. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, in here. And uh, so, so all this, you know, the, the fluctuations in VC, this is due to local orientation. Local well, okay, so, all right, so now, you, you know, you see there are bright areas and dark areas. So you go back to our original argument where, in this case, we have a polarizer and analyzer that are vertical and horizontal, where the in-plane orientation gets to be either parallel or perpendicular to the polarizer, then it's going to be dark. Um, and you can check that by taking this whole sample and rotating it in the microscope. And then you'll watch these, these brushes move across the, the field. So the visualization of bright and dark here is showing the, you know, the, is, is visualizing the s muthal orientation of the liquid crystal. You see that there are areas where there are smooth variations, but then there are, there are these sort of places where they're, they look discontinuous. So the places where they're discontinuous are topological singularities in the orientation field. We'll talk about those. Um, and, but you see that, but that generally, for example, if I, especially if I go back to this picture, um, that this, this nomadic with the crystal is trying to be smooth. Okay. Um, and you know that's sort of prima facie evidence that it's the, that this orientation field is governed by a kind of elasticity. Okay. So we'll talk about that. No, can I ask? Uh, so do you see these dark brushes where it's uh, either lined with analyzer or polarizer? Yeah. But that assumes that you're not hitting some thickness where you get elliptical or circular polarization where you should get. Some, you know, some transmission. Well, or are you in a thick enough for you? I mean, if your light, um, you know, if your light comes in, you know, along one of the normal, along one of the principal axes, right? So then you only excite oh, one see. mode. Death yeah. propagates without change, okay. and then it gets extinguished. Yeah, I welcome questions as we go along here. So, but you still have two variables then. Right, one is the biofinity of the molecules in there or the particles in there, and the other one is the sample thickness. Yeah, but in, in like in, in, in these pictures, um, <clears throat> I mean you can be fairly rest assured that the birefringence, you know, the local optical anisotropy is the same everywhere. Yeah, okay. Okay. Can you tell them? Sure. Uh, I mean, what's the reason that you can... Well, this is, uh, I mean, that's kind of something that we know from experience. This is a pneumatic. It's very fluid. So it reaches local equilibrium. Now, you can't say that about every look at crystal sample that you see. But in this case, <clears throat> in this case, it would be true. Now... <clears throat> Another thing that you see from this is that if there is this elasticity, and we can assume that the you know the low relative to elastic deformation, the lowest energy condition is where the director is uniform. Okay, that's what it looks like. You know, you know, you look at these kind of large areas that, that are uniform. It seems like that. You know, that's what's happening. Then you could ask, well, why isn't this thing just, you know, just all aligned in one direction? That's its elastic, <coughs> elastic energy minimum. Um, the answer to that is that this, the interaction with this surface is not spatially homogeneous. So the surface has <coughs> imperfections, which, which trap. The orientation field. So <clears throat> these defects, which would like to attract one another and annihilate, get stuck. Okay. So 
in, in this pattern, we're looking at the effect of quench disorder in the interaction between the liquid crystal and, and the surface. And Leo and Quan can tell you all about this. So, sorry. So uh, you said that that was pretty much an equilibrium. So is that the well, same? Well, it's equilibrium subject to this, subject you know, to this, you know, this inhomogeneous interaction with the surface. But so is that saying that if you, you know, put in those pinning sites into some program, that the rest of the shapes are pretty much determined by that? Yeah. The, the shapes are uniquely determined by those finite number of discontinuities. Right. Okay, so uh, that, no, was that really true that it's equilibrium? I mean, in other words, if I heat that up and then cool it down and have exactly the same pattern? Well, you may get a different pattern because I mean the pinning is kind of an interaction between the you know the liquid crystal that, and the that surface. Pre that, that means it's not equilibrium. Well, you mean you know, you know you have quench disorder, so it's not equilibrium, right? And so if you thermally cycle this. Some, sometimes, in some cases, you'll get exactly the same pattern back. In other cases, you'll get a completely different pattern. You know, that kind of depends on the details of the interaction with the surface. There are definitely distribution of low energy sort of configurations that are nearly degenerate. So you can okay, so uh, here are three molecules that make pneumatic phases. Paris oxyanosol was uh, <coughs> first made in the early 1900s, so this has kind of been a classic uh, <clears throat> pneumatic little crystal. MBBA was made in the 1970s. This was the first room temperature pneumatic. So PAA is pneumatic at around 100, 120 centigrade. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> then 5CB is a, <clears throat> is a, uh, is a another room temperature pneumatic. Uh, <clears throat> MBBA has this shift space connecting the two rings together. This molecule will combine with water to make two halves. So it's, it hydrolyzes, it's chemically unstable. 5CB on the other hand <clears throat> is, is very chemically stable. Um, the invention <clears throat> of 5CB uh, which got uh, <clears throat> George Gray the Nobel or the uh, Kyoto Prize, um, really was the <clears throat> one of the major events in uh, converting liquid crystal science to uh, to display technology. So this is a chemically stable um, <clears throat> you can make mixtures of very you know things with different t tail lengths, make a broad temperature range. <laughs> which were the, you know, used in all the uh, early display devices for, for 15 or 20 years. So this molecule has a cyano group parallel to the long axis. This <clears throat> makes the, uh, when you make a pneumatic of this, so actually I should, <clears throat> when <clears throat> I drew the picture of the pneumatic, we draw it like, <clears throat> like this, so like ellipso structureless ellipsoids. Uh, <clears throat> so implying that there's no difference between this and this. Um, but a molecule like this is obviously polar, right? So each of these, <clears throat> each of these ellipsoids has a dipole. But <clears throat> in all known pneumatic phases, the interactions, the dipole-dipole interactions are not strong enough to produce orientation of the dipoles. So the orientation of the dipoles is random. <clears throat> but if you put on an electric field, <clears throat> then you bias this dipole distribution, and that gives you the dielectric constant. It gives you a contribution to the dielectric constant. So <clears throat> having this cyano, which is a large uh, dipole, longitudinal dipole moment, Parallel to long axis, the molecule <coughs> makes epsilon parallel quite large. The dielectric constant parallel for this for this orientation of the field, this stuff is <coughs> on the order of um, 15. 
so <clears throat> quite large. And so that makes this pneumatic response highly responsive to apply like a field. And we'll talk about that <clears throat> as we go along. So this is kind of the liquid crystal hybrid now. <clears throat> All right, so the basic uh, liquid crystal phase is, is this <clears throat> pneumatic. Um, Ryan sort of found liquid crystal behavior in, in cluster albenzoate. This molecule is chiral. And <clears throat> chirality has a really sort of phenomenal uh, <clears throat> manifestation, a variety of really interesting manifestations of liquid crystals because liquid crystals are very responsive. And so uh, putting in broken symmetry. So here we have a carbon with, it's a tetrahedral, car, tetrahedral carbon with something different on each of the four corners of the tetrahedron. That structure is not symmetric under mirror reflection. So it's handy. <coughs> So this, you make a, 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 a pneumatic with a crystal out of this, this molecule, and the handedness <coughs> expresses itself <coughs> as a twisting of the, of, of the director. So <coughs> chiral pneumatics uh, generically <coughs> have this periodic, or this, <coughs> this helix, so it's a, a linear ramp in orientation. Uh, <coughs> that characterizes the colosteric phase. It's called colosteric because the initial molecules is converted to cholesterol, or generically, this is a <coughs> chiral pneumatics. Okay, so <coughs> this is a couple of chiral pneumatic textures. Okay. So <coughs> here, uh, it's the same, here, <coughs> sorry, here is the same treatment same orientation we had in the, in the previous pneumatic example. This is a different orientation. So this is a, a sample between glass plates where the molecules are, <clears throat> the surfaces are treated such that the molecules want to be normal to the surface. Okay. So you do that by uh, <clears throat> starting off with clean glass, for example, <clears throat> and then <clears throat> putting on molecules, surfactants, that stick on the surface. <clears throat> so the polar head goes on the, on the clean glass. <clears throat> so you have these aliphatic tails sticking up. <clears throat> or you can, you can make a self-assembled model here, chemically bond <clears throat> these molecules onto the glass. <clears throat> so you get this <clears throat> aliphatic surface on which <clears throat> these typical pneumatic molecules want to stand up. Okay, so this is homeotropic orientation and normal to the glass. Now, if you make the colosteric cell with this orientation, then you get this helix, the colosteric helix parallel to the glass plates. And here the pitch is long enough, it's about <coughs> 10 or 15 microns. It's long enough that you can see it in the optical microscope. <coughs> now, um, <coughs> This is one hand of this of cholesterol. You can imagine synthesizing the mirror image of this molecule. Then you would have left-handed and right-handed. Now, if you made an equimolar mixture of left-handed and right-handed, then that would be a racemic mixture. <clears throat> that would look like a pneumatic. That would have an infinite pitch. So as you unbalance the antimeric excess, then the pitch will gradually get shorter and shorter until you get some minimum pitch in this helix so the strongest twist occurs when you have all one in, one in antimony. <clears throat> and the pitch that you get depends in detail on the molecular structure. The shortest polysteric pitches are about 0.2 microns. I have a question. So, so far we've seen that the molecules have aromatic rings. Is it important that they have aromatic rings? Well, it's important that they be structurally anisotropic. So, um, you know, sort of, if you're, the theme to make the liquid crystals are molecular rods, then, for example, you know, if you start out, if you just made them all alkanes, you don't get, you don't get liquid crystal. 
and they're just too flexible. So you need rigidity. You don't need aromatic rings, but you need something that's rigid. So you can have like cyclohexane rings, for example. <clears throat> now, the pneumatics I showed you, they all have these, they all have these flexible tails. We'll talk about that in a minute. And they don't have to be a certain length so they can be well, uh, now we'll see that, for example, you can make, you know, you can take a polymer chain and then you can put these things like this. Okay, so this will make a little crystal where the polymer chain just sort of, you know, fits in. Um, in the molecules that I showed, <coughs> The, the, the basic function of these flexible tails is to keep the stuff from freezing. It depresses the, you know, it depresses the, uh, <coughs> the uh, stabilizes the liquid crystal phases relative to the crystal. <coughs> Could you explain again how the relative quantities of right-handed and left-handed affect the pitch? Well, if you have, you know, if you have a mixture of, of left and right, then, um, you know, they're mixed, right? So, uh, you know, the average interactions, you know, um, um, you know, you have a, or, <clears throat> in order to get a twist, you need to have a right-handed molecule sort of interacting with a right-handed molecule. But in a receiving mixture, sometimes it's interacting with the left, and sometimes it's interacting with the right. So these, the chirality sort of averages out. <clears throat> what scales that have fluctuations of this mixing that you have show is not, not locally balanced? You're talking about average or correlative, but if you have... Yeah, I mean, there are local fluctuations, So do you right? see it optically? No. In, in, in the polysterics, there, there are no... There are no experiments that sort of show the effect of the, I mean, the smaller volume you go to, right, the bigger the, the root end fluctuation right. will be in left and right. So the local volumes are all chiral. But <clears throat> on, this, on this sort of macroscopic scale, that averages out. And that has, you know, those kinds of fluctuations really haven't shown up in the experiment that I wrote. Okay, so <clears throat> the other geometry here is we make the same cell that the same kind of cell we had for that pneumatic, but we rub the surfaces. So <clears throat> a way to affect the in-plane orientation of a surface is just to buff it. That's the simplest way. You put a thin polymer layer on the surface and buff it. Then the molecules go down parallel to this buffing direction. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a polysteric in a cell like that. So <clears throat> the uh, rubbing direction <clears throat> Uh, is <clears throat> along the wedge. So this is a wedge cell in which we have uh, molecules parallel to the surface in this direction. <clears throat> so as we go along here, the cell thickness gets bigger, so it accommodates more and more twists of the helix. But they have to appear, they appear as these lines because to get an extra turn of the helix is a topological event. So <clears throat> these are effectively edge dislocations in this periodic, in, in the periodic ordering of the, of the polysteric pitch. <clears throat> um, now, <clears throat> this is a more complicated situation than we dealt with in our biofringence calculation. Because now <clears throat> the light's coming into this liquid crystal and at the surface, you know, it has this orientation. But now as I go into the liquid crystal, the, the, the helix is, the, the or orientation of the optic, <clears throat> the principal axes of the, the local dielectric tensor are precessing <clears throat> at a constant rate. So now this is a new optical problem, more complicated one. Um, <clears throat> Dijen has a nice derivation of that in, <clears throat> in his book. So uh, <clears throat> this becomes periodically a periodic variation in dielectric constant. If you shine light, then, then this periodicity is 
matches the optical wavelength, then for example, you can get Bragg reflection. Here, we're looking at transmission. <coughs> so the transmission is red. This cell is reflecting in the green. <coughs> okay. Now, <coughs> sort of to address kind of the full panoply of the crystal issues then, uh, so here uh, <coughs> we have a, a <coughs> just a sort of a, a rotation around a sim sim single orientation of the uh, <coughs> of the optic axis. Okay, but there are situations where structures where you have <coughs> a full three-dimensional orientation of the dielectric tensor. <coughs> Actually, there's some, this is not in your notes, there's been some, it's evolving, but it'll look, this will be in the posted, <coughs> in the posted notes. So, this is a structure that you can get in a, <coughs> in a calisteric sample. So you have <coughs> these two, um, two glass plates treated for the molecule, to have the molecules normal to the plates. If you make them thin, this gap thin enough, then the tendency for a twist will be suppressed. Okay? So you apply a boundary condition and you can have a polysteric that wants to twist but <clears throat> isn't allowed to by the surfaces. <clears throat> then you can generate with a local perturbation like a little laser, local, local heating with a laser, <clears throat> a defect. Uh, and this defect enables the colesteric to twist. So uh, this is a, a basic colesteric structure that's sort of one step beyond the simple twist that I talked about in the previous slide. So this is a double twist. So we start out with a row molecules standing up in the middle. As we go out in any direction, the director twists. So this is a way of essentially the system getting more twist than just this single helical precession. <clears throat> uh, in this defect, you have this double twist cylinder formed <clears throat> in the form of a loop. So you imagine this thing being long, and you take one end and connect it back on itself. So then you get this thing. And so you can generate this local double twist cylinder <clears throat> in a polysteric. Uh, you need a pair of defects extra defects to account for the topology, but you get a structure that looks like this. So the little, <clears throat> little uh, cylinders here are the director. Uh, <clears throat> so here the director rotates uh, <clears throat> in theta and phi <clears throat> as a function of position. This is full three-dimensional reorientation. Um, <clears throat> And if you look in just in transmission between cross polarizers, then you get a structure like this. So, uh, but for instance, with fluorescence confocal microscopy, you can now visualize this structure in three dimensions. So, this shows the uh, this uh, FCN image. So, to calculate the optical. What was that word? Is F, what did you say? You gave it a name. Fluorescence confocal microscopy. Ah, okay. Okay, so you're, here you're basically focusing light and then collecting light only at any given time, only from one sort of micron cubed position, which you then scan back and forth and create an image. Okay. Well, there are a lot of techniques now for three dimensional visual, visualization. Um, you now, Dijan in his book says, well, the key to really being successful in liquid crystals is to be able to take two-dimensional images like this and understand what the three-dimensional structure is. So, uh, and I think many of us who started in liquid crystals in the 1970s, uh, you know, can get pretty good at that. Now, uh, <clears throat> there are a variety of techniques where you can actually see in three dimensions, and we'll see some examples of those. Uh, <clears throat> all I'm showing, the, the point of this, this slide is just to show that <clears throat> um, you have to uh, 
uh, be able to take start with this biofluidness calculation, which I did the simplest version of, do the three-dimensional uh, version of that, and then do the three-dimensional version of that where the local dielectric tensor uh, reorients in space. Okay. And there are a variety of, of approaches for, for doing this where you uh, where you, you, know, you you take a sample and divide it up into slices and then propagate light from slice to slice. You sort of, uh, as best you can, ignore the, the horizontal spatial variation, but in small defects, then you have to you have to take that uh, <clears throat> that into account also. Um, do, do these structures uh, are, are they uh, stable or are these are stable? What stabilizes them? Well, the <clears throat> the the, the uh, so if without this, you have this chiral pneumatic wants to twist, so uh, you know it's uniformly oriented, so that's a frustrating situation. So <clears throat> this locally uh, permits the, 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 the pneumatic director to twist, which is a lower energy situation. So <clears throat> this defect has low energy in, the, in this region of, of double twist. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the defects cost some energy, but the overall balance is well, you know, is, stabilizes this. It's at least a metastable structure. In other words, if you want to get rid of it, there's a large energy barrier. Okay, we'll talk about about defects. But it's surface stabilized. Well, that's stabilized by this homotropic line. All right, so now I'm going to sort of branch out into some of the kind of, say, tentacles of crystal science, uh, <clears throat> looking at, you know, variations on this, <clears throat> on this theme. So one variation is, you know, getting anisotropy with, with disks rather than rods. Okay. So there are a variety of, <clears throat> of discotic phases. This shows discotic <clears throat> pneumatic phases. Um, <clears throat> Actually, I'll slide later on that uh, I think I'd rather <clears throat> show now. Sorry. About this, but. <clears throat> So <clears throat> I've showed you these pneumatic molecules, and then I just showed you some of these sort of this shape molecules that make uh, <clears throat> discotic pneumatics. Right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the molecules. So, um, <clears throat> so here are two molecules. <clears throat> um, let's see what they're the same, except this has an ester, and this has an amine. <clears throat> This molecule makes symmetric looking crystals. This molecule has no other crystal phase. <clears throat> okay, the only difference is this. Okay, this molecule has no other crystal phases because the amide <clears throat> tends to hydrogen bond with, with an amide and a neighboring molecule. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, so. So here's a typical liquid crystal molecule. This makes a, <clears throat> has a series of synaptic phases, which we'll, we'll talk about. <clears throat> um, and <clears throat> this is from. <clears throat> this uh, <clears throat> is from John Bidby's <clears throat> group. 
So this, this shows the synthetic steps uh, uh, to make this molecule. So if, if you know, John said to a graduate student, you know, we should make this, then, uh, <clears throat> then starting from sort of readily available components, chemical components, so this uh, phenol, you know, brominated phenol, um, then what else? Uh, and here. <clears throat> This brominated uh, phenylpyrimidine. <clears throat> so there's a series of, of chemical steps <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> to first, for example, make this phenylpyrimidine and then uh, <clears throat> and then attach the two tails. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So all these units, these uh, cylinders, this I don't know to say, are interacting just the uh, screw volume interaction. If there is some sort of interaction you use this property. Well, <clears throat> you know, this example shows that you know you, you know you you get you know, I'll, I'll, we'll we'll see what what happens if you just look at steric interactions. So I mean you know you get so far saying okay I'm gonna just the physicist view of a molecule this is like a wiener right and we'll look at the interactions of 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 hard you know hard cylinders. You get, you know, you get a certain amount, you know, a certain way that way. But, you know, this example shows that the molecular details are extremely important, <clears throat> which is sort of the point of this slide. So, to, to do this, you know, it would take a good synthetic chemist a couple weeks. <clears throat> Maybe they could make, you know, a series of homologs with different tail lengths in a couple weeks. But, but doing these various steps and purifications and the evaluation, <clears throat> Um, you know, and you know, if <clears throat> so, and you know, you're making this, you get exactly this. You don't have an opportunity, for example, to <clears throat> to get other things. So, um, you know, you have to design the molecule, and um, <clears throat> you know, if you make the wrong choice, then you know, you don't get any phases. Or you don't get the property that you want. So is that a that's a good rule of thumb that it takes a couple of weeks for it to be done? Well, to make this, I mean, you know, to make that or to make most your general sort of. <coughs> you know, sometimes it'll take a student three months to make something. <laughs> <laughs> and there, you know, and you can have a you can, in a lab, you can have you know somebody that could do this in two weeks, but somebody that would take three months to do. Um, <clears throat> sure, sure. But then some basically you need input stuff, like this is not making it, it's just because you have to get a, put together those molecules, right? No, oh, yeah, this stuff you buy it, you know, from Sigma Aldrich. And yeah, but with the last one. So you start the liquid crystal making from the last part. No, you started from here and here and then the. the only thing. And here. So there's four things you started with this and this. And this, and then this other tail. Yeah, okay, but then you have a stock. Why not? Sorry? Then you have a stock of molecules, and you can. Well, okay, so then you, you know, you, you do this reaction, and typically you'll get a couple hundred milligrams of this stuff. Now, if this turned out to be, you know, <clears throat> Viagra or something, you know, you could make it by the carload, you know, in an industrial process, right? But. <clears throat> You know, in a in a in a lab, I mean, you know, the crystal lab, you know, these are made in hundreds of milligram quantities. You know, so this gives, I mean, and this I think polymer science has the same, <clears throat> this sort of same flavor, and that is the field advances kind of more in, as much as a as an art as a science. In other words, you have to you know understand what you want to make. And then you have to make a particular choice. So, uh, you know, so there are, you know, intuitions. There's experience based on the behavior in the literature of, of molecules like this, and the intuitions that tell you that this is what you want to make. But then you're making a serious commitment to that molecule. <clears throat> and there's no shortcuts. I mean, there's no way, you know, in a lab to make this in an hour, you know, or a day. So, I just want to, you know, you should appreciate the molecules. 
as we go along. <laughs> okay, that's so, in that, so Noel, in that regard, to what, ex to what extent are the, is the quantum chemistry strong enough that you can make predictions? You know, <clears throat> for example, 5CB, the liquid crystal hydrogen atom, you, know, you can run atomistic simulations of that. You can get the phase transition temperatures right, and you can get the, the uh, <clears throat> you know, like the optical properties right. You know, you, you can do a good job on that. But it's, it's still, you know, not <clears throat> um, efficient enough to, uh, you know, to sort of screen massive, num you know, massive sort of uh, <clears throat> different kinds of molecules. And you'll see in the, as we go along in the phases that are being generated. I mean, <clears throat> you know, the, the combination of what phase you might be interested in and what molecules you might want to make just <clears throat> is still not within reach. But I mean, I think there's progress being made there. <clears throat> okay, so... And physicists reduce all this to one rod, to a rod, right? Yeah, well, we'll get to the rods here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> the second major pathway to liquid crystals is to <clears throat> introduce fluid interfaces into systems, and you know this is basically its most positional ordering, and <clears throat> the basic phases here are the symmetric A, where <clears throat> Uh, you have these rod-shaped molecules that, you know, otherwise would be pneumatic, now <clears throat> sort of getting next to each other. So these, these rings have a tendency to be more polarizable than the tails, and so <clears throat> there's a tendency for the molecules to want to be next to each other. Uh, <clears throat> but probably more importantly, the, <clears throat> the tails and the cores are very different in character in terms of their flexibility. And so <clears throat> flexible and not flexible things tend not to mix, which I'm sure you've <clears throat> um, <clears throat> heard of in the <clears throat> polymer discussions and, and sort of in your knowledge of solid matter physics. So we'll see that sort of expressed in the crystals. All right, so this shows some spectic A textures. <clears throat> this, again, is molecules unconstrained on the surface, but parallel to the surface. So this makes the layers perpendicular to the surface. Um, and, uh, okay, so then you get these, in this case, these radius, <clears throat> these defects where optically you can tell that the director, the light orientation, is radial. So if I would look at this thing under, and, and rotate the sample, then nothing, this would look exactly the same. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's circularly, circularly uh, symmetric. <clears throat> um, this is another sort of similar <clears throat> texture. <clears throat> now, the fact that liquid crystals have these layered phases was <clears throat> first appreciated by George Friedel, um, who's one of the real heroes of liquid crystal science. He's the one that named pneumatic smectic, pneumatic and smectic phases. Um, so George, in his study of, of, uh, of, of materials that he got from Mono Lehmann, uh, <clears throat> saw these kinds of, of textures in a liquid crystal phase. Um, so, look at this, and um, this turns out to be almost, per these are almost perfect ellipses. And, and these points are at the, right, at the, uh, the foci. <clears throat> this point is at, at the foci, focus of this ellipse. Um, <clears throat> you end up with other sort of related defects with lines and parabolas. Okay. Now, from this image, Friedel inferred that the <clears throat> liquid 
crystal he was looking at was later. This is in the early 19, in the 1915s. <coughs> Interesting, you know, he, he worked on Lego crystals for 20 years and basically he published one paper, 300 pages long, <laughs> in 1922. So you can think about that. Um, okay, so X ray scattering wasn't applied to soft matter until 1933. <clears throat> so, how do you tell that something's layered? an image like this. <clears throat> One of the great achievements in the crystal science. <clears throat> so, um, one of the sort of popular topics, um, <clears throat> mathematical topics of the day, were the cyclides of Dupin. <clears throat> um, so, <clears throat> this, this picture down here, these were made by, uh, by J.C. Maxwell. He worked, Maxwell worked on the cyclides of Japan. <clears throat> and you can actually get his book from Amazon, on Amazon.com. Maxwell wrote a book on the cyclides of Japan. <coughs> which is very kind of interesting. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the cyclides of Japan uh, have to do with harmonic functions. And uh, <clears throat> they're a way of generating surfaces. So <clears throat> this is a cyclone, this surface is a cyclide of Dupin. It's a multiple connected surface with this little hole here. <clears throat> and you generate this surface in the following way. You start with a plane, and then you have a, cir a circle and a line <clears throat> in this plane. And then you have a sphere. <clears throat> the sphere moves in the plane. It has to, in, in, it has to be tangent to the circle and tangent to the line. So you move the sphere subject to the constraints that it's in contact, every, always in contact with the circle, always in contact with the line, moving in the plane. <clears throat> okay, so then you immediately see that the trajectory of the sphere is a parabola. <clears throat> okay, so you <clears throat> sort of sweep out all possible spheres with centers on this parabola. So you vary its radius. You vary its radius and its, and its position. All right, <clears throat> in doing so, you'll end up dividing space into two parts. One part that <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> where the point was inside one of these spheres, and the other part points that were never inside any of the spheres. Okay, the surface that divides those two regions <clears throat> is the cyclide of Dupin. And for this, for this example, that surface looks like this. <clears throat> so, you know, when the spheres get, you know, when you go out of here, the spheres get very big. <clears throat> you know, the radius goes to infinity, and then so there's you know, it's sort of flat. <clears throat> On this end here, the spheres go through this sort of channel that produces this, this hole. <clears throat> okay, so that's a surface. Okay, so then you can change the radius of the circle and the radius and the position of this line a little bit <clears throat> such that the, the, the parabola remains the same. Okay. <clears throat> so if you do that, then you get another surface. You get a second surface that's just displaced from this original surface by a little bit. And the interesting thing is that that displacement <clears throat> is exactly the same everywhere. Okay. <clears throat> so here's, here's an example. <clears throat> this is a cyclide that's generated from two circles, which is, another, which is one of the other possibilities. So here's a family of these. Of these, of these surfaces generated in this case. Here are the, you know, here, as we change the radius of the circles, here are the cyclides. This is what they look like in detail. <clears throat> so this normal spacing between the layers is exactly the same everywhere. Friedel knew this. So to go from one to the other, how do you? 
when you go from here to here, there's a normal there's a normal space. Yeah, but you, you do what to the to the circle? You have to change you have to change the, the, radius, you know, the radius of one. I think you reduce the radius of one, you increase the radius of the other, such that you know the ellipse is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Fregel knew this, and so from from these <coughs> observations, he stated that this phase that was producing this was a layered phase, two-dimensional fluid layers, because obviously these surfaces are <coughs> these surfaces are curved. <coughs> so <coughs> this is kind of an introduction to thinking like a little crystal about um, <coughs> curved surfaces. So uh, <coughs> the the spectic has no problem of curving its layers, but <coughs> in order for this structure to be maintained, obviously uh, <coughs> these layers are very well defined in thickness. So spectics have layers which are difficult to change in thickness. But, but easy to bend. Okay, so then you can get ellipses, or you can stretch this ellipse out so that this focus goes to infinity, then you get uh, parabolas. Or you can put the fo focuses together, then you'll get circles <coughs> with, with lines coming out perpendicular, with a line coming out perpendicular. So in this geometry, this structure, oh, so let me just say one more thing. So why do you see, so what causes this singularity that you actually see in the microscope? Um, if, we, if we go back to, if we go back to this case, so you can vary the radius of the circle and the position of the line and keep this parabola. So as you do that, you come to the situation where the, the, the line and the circle actually meet at the parabola, and then they cross. And once they cross, then there's an excluded region. So you, the, the circles come down to this point. They get smaller and smaller and smaller. So they make a cone. So this is a conical cusp in the layer. That's this, these, those are these points. <coughs> um, here, in these cyclides, you, the conical cusp is, is here. And then you see it in this drawing here. So the conical cusps are along the are along these the ellipse, and in this case the hyperbola, they're along the hyperbola. So that's what shows up in the microscope. <coughs> okay. Um, so since the days of Friedel, it's been known that there are these uh, fluid spectric phases. Friedel's phases had the molecules normal to the layers. The other basic uh, fluid spectic phase is the spectic C, where the molecules are tilted in the layers. Okay, so um, if you look again texture, so the glass plates are now parallel to the screen. This is the spectic A between cross polarizers. So if it's a spectic A, the optic axis is coming up normal to the screen. Uh, so this is isotropic in the plane, and uh, so you get extinction. So this is the domain where the layers are standing up perpendicular to the plates. Now, if you go to the spectic C phase, the molecules tilt over. So now locally, you have a tilt direction. So you have in-plane anisotropy, and then that shows up. <coughs> Uh, is in the bottom here. So this is a the gray, gray areas here are a texture in the azimuthal orientation of the, the tilt direction. So <clears throat> the, that's described by this azimuthal variable, so you have a fixed tilt and then locally some azimuthal direction. Um, you see Again, smooth variations here, and then there are point defects. We'll see them a little later. Um, so in this, as a youth orientation, you can have uh, <coughs> topological singularities, which will show up in this, in this texture. 
Um, so theoretically, uh, you can think of this as the 3 dxy model, which uh, Dijan started thinking about <coughs> uh, in, the, in the 1970s. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. <coughs> Okay, so um, I've shown you a bunch of, of, of textures, and you know it's obviously that, that textures are very useful in the, in this business. Um, let me just sort of run down what you know. I've shown you know spectacular textures that are very different, thematic textures that are that are somewhat different. What does the texture depend on? Um, well, it depends on what phase you have. Um, it depends on the cell thickness, so the birefringence color depends on, on, the, on the thickness. <clears throat> but uh, the cell thickness can also affect what structure you have. So <clears throat> in this example of the skirmion, you know, if I have homeotropic surfaces, if I make in a thick cell, the helix will come in, in a chiral pneumatic. But if I make the cell thin enough, then this whole alignment on the surface will suppress the, <coughs> suppress the helix. So the structure that you get in a cell uh, depends on the cell thickness. <coughs> Obviously, how you treat the surfaces, whether the molecules are standing up or parallel, or uh, <coughs> whether you have in-plane anisotropy or not. <coughs> the thermal history. So, you very often get something different if you're heating from, from below than if you're cooling. <clears throat> um, it depends on the adjacent phases. So <clears throat> if you, for example, go isotropic, pneumatic, smectic, you get very different textures from, say, going isotropic to smectic. So <clears throat> if you have, a, very often, the pneumatic will be aligned by the surface so the spectacle will grow <clears throat> from an aligned pneumatic. You get a different texture if it grows than if it grows from the isotropic. Impurities. So um, impurities cause phase separation at the phase conditions. So you get two-phase behavior. <clears throat> or you can get chromatography. So if you have impurities in a crystal, if you fill a cell, <clears throat> say you have a thin cell, you just fill it by capillarity when the crystal flows in. <clears throat> you find one alignment where, you know, it started to flow in and a different alignment on the other side of the cell because impurities in the living crystal played out on the, uh, <clears throat> on the surfaces and changed the alignment. And then <clears throat> uh, flow can also affect the texture and I should put it in quench disorder in this <clears throat> scenario. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> here's a different kind of preparation that has <coughs> proved quite useful uh, <clears throat> for looking at that layer of spectic layer crystals, previously suspended films. So, like soap films, uh, <clears throat> you can take a little, uh, hole in a plate, put some little crystal at the edge, pull a film across. And <clears throat> Uh, in spectic phases, the, the film is stabilized in thickness by the tendency for, <clears throat> for layering. So you get films that are quantized in thickness corresponding to a <clears throat> certain number of layers. You can study these films <clears throat> by optical microscopy, looking in reflected light. And if they have in-plane anisotropy, then you can use polarizing analog. <coughs> And uh, very much like the, the transmission by refringents, you can look at the effect of this in-plane anisotropy on the, on the reflection. So you can visualize, for example, uh, topological, you have topological singularities, and you can visualize these. Um, so this, this is a one a molecular monolayer freely suspended in air. Of this, of this bent core of the crystals. This is one layer looking at reflection <coughs> with a 
So this <coughs> layer has in-plane ordering because of the, the shape of this molecule. The bed shape <coughs> tends to pack together and give you a, a polar-oriented, locally polar structure. And <coughs> in this model layer, this has a single this <coughs> single topological singularity with this uh, <coughs> with this sort of structure where the vectors are the the local orientation of this molecule. <clears throat> so uh, you can look at monolayers. Um, <clears throat> now in these films, you can have regions of different thickness. And because of the symmetric layering, again, the thickness is quantized. So you get, <clears throat> um, you get what we call islands. <clears throat> and in a symmetric C film, the islands, so the <coughs> pair of islands, will <coughs> interact with the molecular orientation field. So out here we have, <coughs> uh, so this is a symmetric layer parallel to the screen. It's a couple layers thick out here. <coughs> the molecules are tilted out here, they're tilted down. So the little T's indicate the tilt direction. So the azimuth orientation is down. And the, the drawings here just show the spatial variation of the azimuth orientation. So the, the islands uh, are a boundary, present a boundary condition to this orientational field. The director has to be tangential to the islands. Um, so this enforces a topological defect, a plus one topological defect in <coughs> this orientation field. Um, so there have to be corresponding negative singularities in the field, and that's, that's shown here. This island has this companion defect. This island has this companion defect. How do, looking at this uh, picture, how do you know that this is this is a uh, symmetric and it's not pneumatic? Looking well, at, uh, the microscope, uh, the microscope. so well, this is a very pneumatic-like texture, right? So this is a pneumatic in two dimensions. So this texture, this in-plane texture, is a pneumatic. You draw something in the microscopic level, you draw something which is symmetric. No, 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 sorry, that's that's not a good drawing. I mean, these things are, you know, should be sort of randomly positioned. Even, I mean, even in the left slide, so the fact that it was symmetric, and this also seems like something that could be in the I mean, how can you... Are you looking from the bar? Yeah, so the, 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 you know, these are sort of drawn in rows, but, but you know, there, <coughs> there's... No information. This drawing, there's no information in the position of these little T's. If, if, if we go back, if you can, if we go back one slide, another. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's how one. It said symmetric A. Okay. This one? Yeah, exactly. So how do you know this is symmetric and open up? <coughs> well, okay, so. There's no so to make this image, we start off with this material. You know, we, we, we put it on the edge of this glass slide, and with the spreader, you know, we, we draw a film. So in order for that film to be stable, it has to be, has to be layered, it has to be symmetric. If you, if you took a pneumatic look at crystal and, and did this, then the films would just break. But had I not known uh, the process in which this was produced, and I was only looking at the microscope picture, so yeah. I wouldn't be able to tell whether this is symmetric or not. Okay, so... Uh, in this case. Right, so now, we're, in this case, we're talking about these free suspended film experiments. So, in order to make a film, you have to have this layering. So, we're only talking about symmetrics, okay? okay. They, they just break in the pneumatic, right? They're they the just same. break in the pneumatic. Okay, then... If you have a, a symmetric A, then um, <clears throat> this is a symmetric A film. So if we look at this between cross-polarizer and analyzer, this would just be black. 
because optically <clears throat> you know, the layers are parallel to the screen. You know, we're looking, we're looking in. <clears throat> uh, the optic axis is normal to the screen, so that's going to look isotropic and cross-polarizer and analyzer. So the fact that <clears throat> you know, in, in reflection between cross-polarizer and analyzer, you have this this texture tells you that there's in-plane in isotropy. Okay. <clears throat> and then the structure of this field tells you, you know, what the, you know, what the nature of the, <clears throat> of the in-plane anisotropy is. We're just comparing the micrographs, you cannot say which one it is. No. You won't be able to say a spectrum from here. Just by, by the images. Just by the images. I mean, well, if it's spent a day, if it's, if it's spent a day then this, this, this will all be dark. I mean, in some sometimes I mean that's two dimensional structure is two D matter, right? It isn't. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the reason. Okay, so um, the reason I put this little vignette about really suspended films in here uh, <clears throat> is to sort of uh, <clears throat> show you what what these things will actually look like. Um, <clears throat> All right, so just to recap, so we have two islands here. They're, they're <clears throat> like five layers thick. The background film is a couple layers thick. In the background film, you have this local anisotropy. So the little T's are just showing the direction of the, of the, of the anisotropy. So, <clears throat> so they, uh, they're tangential to the islands and then tangential to this island. Uh, so these are two plus one defects. You have to have minus one corresponding charges to have this thing in this sort of uniform area. So out here, the, we're, we have a, you know, this whole thing is on a more or less uniform orientation field. So if we have just a single island, then the island would have this companion, would have a companion. This is plus one, this would have a companion minus one defect. <clears throat> this slide is just showing that if you, so th these islands are, have chirality depending on which way the director goes around. So if you go left and right, you get quadrupole organization of the, the same chirality, then they chain up like, like dipoles. <clears throat> All right, so why do we want to see this slide so I can show this video? <clears throat> So this is what this looks like in real time in, in, the, in the microscope. We're moving the optical tweezers off here. That will be gone in a second. So this is what liquid crystals really are doing. So what you're seeing here are thermal orientation fluctuations. This is a real time video of 30 frames per second. Um, well, okay, so you see that sort of everything's in Brownian motion. The, you know, the islands are jiggling around. Um, okay, so there are the, these two plus one singularities, and then these are, <coughs> these point defects are the minus one singularities. Again, this, this is two layers thick. We're looking at reflection again. Um, <coughs> So you see that the defects sort of behave as if they're as if they're objects. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> is this fair electric or no? How come the, the brushes are pretty sharp? Well, <clears throat> we're just good microscopists. <laughs> <laughs> I usually they're more diffused. I mean they go to you know, this the core of this defect is probably, you know. 10 nanometers in diameter or something. So these brushes will come down to like 10 nan nanometers across. We go. <coughs> Why is quadrupolar symmetric? Sorry? Why is quadrupolar symmetric? It looks like a, there's a short. Yeah, I think that's. <coughs> you know, it could be, you know, the, I think it's because the outer, the outer, you know, there's something, you know, there's something off the picture here we're not seeing. It's actually something else. 
Yeah, I mean, there's some other, you know, it just, it, it's not perfectly uniform as we go, you know, away from this. Um, okay, so, uh, are the circles, I mean, it's post-processing, it's, you highlight the things, or it's the actual image? No, this is the actual image. So why are the circles, I mean, the... The boundaries are not treated? Well, because the, <clears throat> so the islands, um, this is the structure of an island. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the islands have this edge which has extra surface. So <clears throat> if you, you know, if you make the, uh, the edge length of the island longer, that costs energy. So there's a line tension, <clears throat> like a surface tension. There's a line tension on the islands that, you know, tends to reduce the temperature is not enough to excite. And that's, that energy, that's costing nothing energy, so it's not substantially excited. But, you know, we can see that there are, you know, the, 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 these boundaries are diffuse, if you, you know, on a smaller, on a smaller length scale. Okay, so uh, there are some interesting uh, things to look at here. One is, you can see, let's just go back to this for a minute. You can, one thing we'll, we'll look at briefly is, uh, you know, you can see the, you can get an idea of how big the orientation fluctuations are. Um, how big the core, you know, what the extent of the correlations are. I mean, if we go from a black to a bright here, we're, we're, we're reorienting by 45 degrees. So you can see that these fluctuations are something like 20 degrees back and forth. So uh, in liquid crystal cells, uh, usually the dark brushes are not fluctuating this much. Is that because you have a air fluctuation? Well, okay, so this is a this is a two-dimensional pneumatic. It's only two layers thick. So the effective elasticity is very small. Now, in a three-dimensional pneumatic, you can imagine just stacking these things up, right? So now each <coughs> molecule in each layer is not only interacting with the neighbor's in-plane, but also with the neighbor's out-of-plane. So in three-dimensional pneumatics, the fluctuations are much smaller. <clears throat> so, so if you put that into a vacuum, would that be like a lot of difference? Uh, you, you put this in a vacuum and very little happens. The liquid crystals have very low vapor pressure. And this is a one-component system. Unlike soap pills, for example, which are water and soap. This is just the one component in the crystal. <clears throat> No, I, I, I guess maybe he's wondering whether some of the fluctuations are coming from the air currents in the room, or, or it's all... Well, I mean, it's... The film. <clears throat> no, could you repeat the question? We didn't hear what... Okay, the question is, what, you know, is, is air... So this is a film in air. <clears throat> uh, the question is, uh, how is the air affecting what we're seeing here? Um, actually, we're doing experiments on that now, but uh, <clears throat> I think qualitatively, if you, you know, were to reduce the air pressure, uh, you know, you would, you know, and looked at a pair of islands like this, it would look fundamentally, it would look basically the same. I mean, there would be a difference in detail. <clears throat> so uh, an interesting question here is, you know, how big the fluctuations are. So you see that they're, they're, they're 20 degrees sort of <clears throat> um, averaged, you know, with this, 30th of a second sort of averaging time, looking at uh, micron scales. An interesting question is, how big are the fluctuations of individual molecules in this thing? And you know, we can make an estimate of that. But I wanted to just show this, just to give you a feeling for what, uh, you know, what these things are, are doing on a microscopic scale. All right, so. No, maybe, I'm not sure, but this. If you switching topics, it may be a good time to stop. Okay, right. Fine. Uh, we can do that. Yeah.